Late in the evening, a deal takes place in a pawn shop. A man opens a suitcase and hands over a key to the buyer, who transfers $2 million to his account. When both the seller and the buyer plan to part ways, a group of people bursts into the shop, clearly with other plans. Third, the leader of the group offers the buyer to voluntarily hand over the key, clicking an ordinary-looking ballpoint pen in front of him. The police arrive on the call and discover something terrible in the pawn shop. Both the seller and the man who sold the key look as if they became direct participants in a barbecue, with one of them hanging on the wall and the other protruding from the ceiling of the room. After cross-checking witness statements, the cops find out that there was another person present during the deal, a young guy named Ignacio Loso, who miraculously managed to escape. Detective Joe Miller has known the guy since childhood, so he plans to quickly track him down and find out what happened in the shop. Not only the police, but also Ferret, who could not retrieve the key that everyone is hunting for, set out to search for Ignacio. Joe and his partner Lou spot Ignacio in a dark alley, and the cop tries to catch up with him. But the guy runs up to the first door he sees and opens it with the infamous key, rushing into the room from which bright beams of light are emanating. When Joe opens the door, it turns out to be an ordinary toilet, with no trace of the fugitive. In the evening, Joe has dinner with his daughter Anna, whom he's raising alone, but he is currently going through legal disputes with his ex-wife over her custody. The girl tells her father his cool news, but their conversation is interrupted by a phone call. Lou informs Joe that Ignacio has been detained and taken to the police station. Miller arrives at work and closes himself in a room with the guy to find out who he's trying to hide from. Ignacio reluctantly mentions Ferret but mumbles something, and as soon as he gets the chance he grabs the motel room key from the desk and opens the door from the office with it, disappearing. Looking through the surveillance camera footage, Joe sees the guy opening the door inside the office, but he doesn't appear in the hallway. Lou finds out that before the employee of the pawn shop died, he called his boss, Carl Kreutzfeldt, and the cops head straight to the pawn shop owner, hoping to find out details about what happened. But Carl says that the employee just asked to close the shop a little earlier, and nothing in the conversation worried the boss. Kreutzfeldt asks to be excused as he's a bit busy. Today's his little son Isaac's birthday and he doesn't want to be distracted from the celebration by talking to the police. Ignacio walks through the empty parking lot talking on the phone. The guy says he wants to get rid of the key and has a meeting with a buyer scheduled. Suddenly a black car attacks Ignacio but he manages to dodge it. A shootout begins and when Ignacio opens the door with his key he gets hit by one of the bullets. Joe cleans up the kitchen with his daughter and hears someone rummaging in the closet. When he opens the door he finds wounded Ignacio there, who only manages to hand the detective the key and say that it can open absolutely any door in the world before his eyes. After waiting for Anna to fall asleep, Joe takes the strange object and uses it to open the door to the closet, but instead finds himself in a completely different place, an unknown motel room. He closes his eyes and imagines a place where he would like to be, and he steps out of the room onto a sandy beach by the ocean. After wandering from room to room with the key, Joe returns home, realizing what he now possesses. Unfortunately, Anna wakes up and sees where her father came from, which arouses her curiosity. Dr. Martin Ruber, a forensic expert from Joe and Lou's department, carefully studies photos from the crime scene, comparing them with the similar cases. While Joe is distracted cooking breakfast, Anna takes the key from the table and tries to open the room. She tells her father that all the toys she throws in there disappear when the room is closed. Joe asks his daughter not to tell anyone about their discovery and especially not to enter the room without him. Joe goes to Lou's house and tells him about the key, demonstrating its features. The men explore the motel room and travel to unusual places from there. A certain Jennifer Losa comes to Joe's office, introducing herself as the sister of deceased Ignacio. The girl asks to collect her brother's personal belongings, but the detective realizes that she only needs the key. Knowing the guy since childhood, he is sure that he never had any sisters. The girl takes out a nail file out of her purse, and the detective blacks out while looking at it. Anna is appointed a meeting with a psychologist for a court decision regarding child custody. Leaving his daughter with the doctor, Joe plans to visit a cafe across the street, but something unusual happens to him in the clinic hallway. One of the patients flicks him on the forehead with a bus ticket, and he finds himself on the road somewhere on the outskirts of the city. Using the key, Joe returns back and immediately bumps into the same patient who again sends him to the desert. This continues until Joe knocks out the guy and takes the ticket from him. Joe takes Wally to the cafe to talk to him about the strange objects and finds out that besides the ticket and the key, there are many other objects, each with extraordinary properties. 
He also learns that the motel room is surrounded by various legends and rumors, but no one knows for sure what happened there and how all these objects appeared. Returning to the clinic, Joe learns that some man just took Anna. At the same time, an unknown number calls the detective's phone, and Horace tells the man that he's ready to return his daughter in exchange for the key. Joe drives to the specified location, trying to call Lou on the way. Upon arrival, the cop realizes that no one will let him go, even if he returns the object calmly. A fight begins, and in fear, Anna grabs the key and jumps into the first room she sees, slamming the door in front of Ferret, who tries to get the item he needs and renovates the room. Anna disappears. In rage, Joe is ready to tear Ferret apart, but he shouts that he knows how to get his daughter back. Joe is lying in the motel room, thinking about where he should look for his daughter. At the same time, a case is opened against him because the cops are convinced that his colleague kidnapped Anna to prevent her from being given to his ex-wife for upbringing. Leaving a note on the table, Joe exits the room. Joe finds Wally again and asks him to help him find Anna. Wally explains that there are objects that, when combined with others, reveal new properties. And if you collect the necessary set and combine them with the key, you can open the room where the girl ended up. Returning home to gather his things, the cop sees a business card on the table from a certain Jennifer Bloom, and opening the door with the key, he is transported directly to her. It turns out that she's Ignacio's fake sister, or as it turns out, a member of the Legion who is engaged in searching for the objects. The girl offers to help the cop to find his daughter, but he refuses, realizing that the Legion is only interested in the key. Intercepting Ferret, the detective takes the burning pen from him and checks it for other objects, after which the men are transported to Ferret's lair, where there is a whole map of the objects. It turns out that there is a certain main object, and with its help, Anna can be found. According to the object hunter, it is a tabletop clock that is stored with Kreutzfeldt. Despite all the difficulties, the men manage to retrieve the main object, but the clock doesn't help him bring Anna back. Ferret attacks Joe, who trusted his friend, but it turns out that the objects in the motel room do not have their own power. For his betrayal, the cop throws the object hunter out the door, and he ends up right at Kreutzfeldt's feet, with whom they have been at war for many years. Lou finds out that their forensic scientist Martin Ruber has become obsessed with the legend of the key and its objects. The detectives go to see their colleague, but it turns out that he has literally gone insane with a desire to possess the key. He shoots Lou without hesitation and frames Miller for the attack, who is already wanted for the kidnapping of his daughter. Waking up from a nightmare in the motel room, Joe takes his coat from the wardrobe and goes out onto the street, where Jennifer is already waiting for him. She hands him fake documents and a couple of credit cards so that he can avoid being caught by his colleagues, at least for a while. In a small shop, a strange Mr. Stritsky asks the seller to give him the printed photographs while tapping his comb on the counter. When the seller makes some sharp remarks about the customer, he runs his comb through the hair and disappears with the money from the cash register. Joe fails to find the door and falls into the hands of Kreutzfeldt's guards. He doesn't have the key on him, but the collector immediately realizes where the guest's coat came from. After retrieving the item, Carl releases the detective, expressing sympathy for Anna's disappearance. Joe returns to the alley from where he was recently taken and finds the abandoned key there. After resting in his room, he goes back to Kreutzfeldt and asks him to tell him more about the objects. The collector says that there is a certain storage room where the main object is located, as well as a glass eye that Carl himself needs to cure his son of a serious illness. The men agree to help each other. Joe also turns to Jennifer for help and asks her to find a certain Barbara Stritsky who owned the coom from the motel room. Bloom agrees to participate, but warns Joe that his friendship with Kreutzfeldt is very risky, as the girl knows him from the legion he once belonged to. Joe manages to catch Harold and persuades him to give him a couple of lessons on how to use the comb. Miller promises to return it as soon as he can find Anna. Stritsky takes his new friend to an abandoned house in the woods that once belonged to his aunt, and there the men find another object, several photos with an unclear image. The solution to the photo mystery has to be postponed for later, as the house is surrounded by hunters and the company has to hide, using the features of the coom. Stritsky gives Joe his object, no longer wanting to be a target for those who want to get it. Martin Ruber becomes a member of the order that hunts for the objects. The man brings them glasses that prevent combustion and promises to get the key. After finding Wally, Joe asks him to help figure out the photos. The oddball transports himself and his friend to the motel where it all began. The men discover that there are only nine rooms at the site of the ruins, although the keychain shows ten, which means that the tenth room exists but in another dimension. Entering one of the rooms, the friends see the same map of the objects on the floor that Ferret had, but they cannot study it because something strange happens. A woman appears in the room for a moment. 
Joe adapts the video camera which they skate into the room, and despite the damage he manages to see the face of the woman who appears in the room on the recording. On the way out of the hotel the men meet a local resident who strongly urges the strangers to leave his land. At the local cafe, Joe tries to find out from the locals what they know about the motel, but besides staring and silly giggles, he gets nothing. However, the guys discover a photo from the 60s on the wall showing the same woman who is in the room, smiling. Jennifer asks Joe to give up the dangerous search, but he is not ready to give up. Then Bloom gives him her brother's recordings who went insane pursuing this topic. The couple spends the night in the mystical hotel, after which Joe goes to the bathroom and notices a fingerprint on the mirror. Using it, the police database reveals the name of the person who left their mark back in the 60s when the first objects appeared. In the photo, the detective recognizes the same local resident who recently aimed a gun at him. Returning to the motel, Joe visits a farmer who tells him how his wife disappeared from the room while working as a manager in this strange place. Arlene was one of the first to start collecting the objects, and the man even has a video recording from the day the strange room opened for enthusiasts of the business, in which something strange happens, after which the founder of the object's movement disappears. Joe comes to Rupert's house and demands from him a watch case that would help him meet with Arlene and find out what is happening in the closed room when people disappear there. The police detain Miller, but Rupert helps him escape from custody. With the help of the watch case and the coom, Joe and Jennifer manage to bring back Arlene, who has spent many years in an unknown reality. The woman manages to tell the detective that she saw Anna, who is waiting for her father to save her. And she also mentions the photos, after which the founder of the movement closes her eyes. Joe realizes what the photos are for, and takes one of them to the location where the tenth room should be. As the group rotates the photo, they see details of the room through a small window, and Joe notices a man standing by the window. The stranger seems to be looking at Miller through the window, and the detective realizes that the room's occupant whose belongings were ransacked by fanatic collectors is the main object of interest. However, the group has to leave as a convoy of police cars arrives at the hotel. Joe opens the door with the key and after agreeing to Ruber's persuasions lets him into the hideout with him. But the former friend, not realizing that the objects don't work within the confines of the room, tries to knock out Miller with a deck of cards. The cop throws Margin out of the threshold and he finds himself in the middle of the night desert. Detective Lee wakes up from a nightmare in which she sees the mysterious hotel, her former colleague and Anna. Kreutzfeldt arrives at the bookstore of court, a dealer in information about the objects who categorically refuses to deal with the objects themselves. He hands the collector a book with some notes about the artifacts. Joe appears in the room during the transaction and takes Carl with him to the hotel room. The book shows a combination that can be used to enter the collector's storage, which both men need. The detective admits to Carl that he saw the man who is most likely the main object with his own eyes. Kreutzfeldt knew about this theory of the occupant but always considered it nonsense. To enter the storage in addition to the key and the clock, the men need scissors. They buy information about their whereabouts and find themselves in an unpleasant district where their owner lives. Encountering the guests, the hostess uses the magical ability of the object to toss Joe into the air. But upon opening the flask, Carl manages to calm the girl down and help his friend escape. After gathering all possible literature and studying sources, Joe and Carl realize that they need to search for a certain prison where the entrance to the vault is located. The men manage to infiltrate an abandoned colony in Nevada and find the vault, which is located beneath the prison in a bomb shelter. While trapped, they figure out how to get into the vault, using the objects, and end up in an improvised museum with numerous unknown artifacts from the room. Meanwhile, Jennifer studies the video footage and data on the owners of the objects and realizes that Joe is in danger. Kreutzfeldt is collecting the objects to perform a ritual that could destroy everyone around him. This is revealed almost immediately in the vault. Once Carl receives the glass eye and takes the key from Joe, he apologizes for the setup but leaves his partner locked up in the dungeon. It turns out that Isaac passed away a long time ago and the collector's plan is not to heal the boy but to perform a ritual to resurrect him. And the quarter in Carl's pocket is an object that possesses the property of materializing desires. Fortunately, Miller finds Wallace's ticket in Carl's pocket, and with a snap to his forehead, he finds himself on the road not far from the hotel. There, he meets Jennifer and admits that she was absolutely right about Carl. 
Kreutzfeldt carefully studies the video footage showing the ritual and then orders the guard to bring him a painkiller so he can independently implant the glass site himself. Joe begins to search for the motel room tenant, and the archive documents lead him to an old library worker who had once reported a stranger to the police. The stranger had tried to convince the woman that he was her husband, even giving her a photo of them together, but she couldn't remember anything like that. Wally looking at the photo suspects that it too is the object, as the paper hasn't even yellowed over the years, and as is known the objects can be destroyed or damaged outside of the room. Then the men realized that what happened in room 10 erased the entire history of the tenant, turning him and all his belongings into the mystical objects. Arriving at the bookstore, Joe meets Ferret, who, along with the other losers who have lost their objects, is trying to find out about their fate. After gaining access to the bookstore owner, Joe asks him to help find the tenant, which turns out to be not very difficult. By turning on the object movement map, the men see a certain point where the objects have never appeared. It becomes clear that the tenant did everything to keep them away from him. In Kreutzfeldt's house, Jennifer falls into a trap with the Legion teammates. Anyone who comes into the sight of the glass eye is immediately incinerated. Carl opens the door to escape through the hotel room, but Blue manages to pull the trigger. Miller arrives at the psychiatric clinic, where a certain John Doe is lying. The nurse warns that before visiting, the man must empty all the items from his pockets, as they greatly irritate the patient. Entering the ward, Joe sees the same man from the photo, who hasn't aged a day. Joe is aggressively greeted by the tenant, who ends up taking his gun. Pointing into his mouth, he pulls the trigger, but nothing happens, as he is also the object, which further disappoints the tenant. Joe tells him about his daughter, and asks for advice on how to get her back, to which John Doe agrees to help, but only on the condition that the man takes him straight to the hotel. At the same time, Kreutzfeldt is trying to repeat the ritual that Arlene performed many years ago. Attaching the necessary objects to the door, the man opens the room, from which a stream of light is coming out, much brighter than usual. In the doorway, Carl sees Isaac, but the boy does not plan to come out, and calls his father after him. Following the family, the tenant also runs there, whom Joe has just brought to the hotel. And Miller himself, realizing that this is his last chance, steps into the light, closing the door behind him. Joe comes to himself lying on the floor and sees the tenant, who is standing by the window, exactly like in the picture. Eddie McLeister, that's the tenant's name, admits that all these years life has been torture, as the objects feel each other, and for the mind it is an unbearable ordeal. Being in the room, the man finally felt relief, but he understands that he cannot stay here forever. Moreover, to save Anna, Joe himself must become the object, and for this he needs to destroy the previous one, that is, the tenant. Leaving the room, Joe tells Jennifer that the tenant is no more. He enters the neighboring room and asks his friend to refresh the door, turning the key. When the woman turns the key, Joe meets Anna, who has been waiting for her father all this time. After getting outside, Joe introduces Jennifer to his daughter, and then he decides to do the most important thing. Using the key to open the room, he throws it on the floor and slams the door shut. When he opens it again, the key is no longer in the room. The group leaves the ill-fated hotel, hoping that no one else will be able to open the missing room. But in a moment, the door of the room opens, and the key is in the same place where Joe left it. And that's where the miniseries ends.